<clears throat> I didn't fall over, which I'm actually surprised at. So, hi everyone, my name is Kaya. I'm a racial justice and anti-racism advocate here in the very heart of Brighton. And despite the fact I'm standing on this red dot here today, I am just like you guys, a quote-unquote ordinary citizen. I'm here to talk to you all about revolution, a bigger word as it is, because I truly do believe that revolution is a part of our future where social justice causes come nearer, if not fully achieved, to finding and acting upon the solutions needed to heal our sick society. Maybe that sounds optimistic and ambitious, yet my idea of revolution and how this manifests in each and every person's life may be different to what you all are thinking of currently. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to ponder upon the term revolution. What does this mean to you? What does it look like? What songs, quotes, inspirational figures and so forth come to mind when you think about this word? Why you think, for curiosity, I actually searched up for images that hold connotations or implicatures of revolution, courtesy of Google. And um, the results didn't surprise me, and maybe they won't surprise you either. Because when you thought of revolution, did you think of something like this? Or something like this? Or like this. Now, what if I told you that this could be considered to fall under the framework of what I would say is a colonial depiction of radical change? Because societal transformation is not an action movie, nor is it in need of a savior or a hyperactive ego. Not only do these images reflect our scope on history currently, which is in desperate need of decolonizing anyways, in the midst of suggested war, destruction, death, it highlights a very important theme that resonates within our present day and within my own activism experiences. And that is unity within the community. Back in 2020, at the age of 17, I stood at the front of the Brighton Pier with a megaphone in one hand and my pre-prepared speech in the other. It was the 13th of June, a date purposely selected to bring a spotlight to the US 13th Amendment. I co-organized the event, addressed and protested with over 10,000 people, leading them in a collective call against racism. We ended our peaceful demonstration at the Level Park where protesters had the opportunity to literally take the mic and speak unapologetically about their experiences, hopes, and concerns for the future. It was a beautiful and memorable day. However, as the campaign continued, we began to saw less and fewer people. It seemed that the cry for justice was no longer socially convenient or topical. The last demonstration here in Brighton just about secured 100 attendees. And I was not the only person to observe this decline in engagement. I'm going to read to you some statistics I found. How lovely. <laughs> we all have statistics. In September 2020, the Pew Research Center found that a small share of US adults who say they strongly support the Black Lives Matter movement stands at just 29%. Another study conducted by Civics in November 2021, a year later, found that 43% of US adults strongly oppose the movement, which stands at almost half the statistics. These and many other statistics are easily applicable to the UK and the rest of the globe, 
and unfortunately shows us the global insincerity of some of those who profess solidarity to these movements at the time. They may have attracted a virtual pat on the back, but in essence, the only person they are actually serving is themselves. And further damages the group they're opposing to support further. While some people are politely disengaged, those affected by the problem have a very hard and bitter pill to swallow. The hope shared among some people directly affected by systems of oppression would soon be distilled by the energy invested in our collective cause slowly withdrawing. The boom didn't even last long enough to change the lived experiences of those whose interest was in the BLM added to your social media bios whose voices were spoken through those anti-racism books that you brought, who saw you throw statues into our rivers. And all of those black squares are now next to nothing. Revolution is not a one-time event, to quote Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde is an inspiration of mine and a self-described black, lesbian, mother, warrior, poet who dedicated both her life and her creative talent to confronting and addressing injustices globally. I'm going to read to you some key points of an extract she wrote back in 1982 called Learning from the 60s. Her poignant observations of the civil rights movement in the 60s, I believe, deeply resonates with the nationwide demonstration sparked by the death of George Floyd in 2020. 60 years later. I believe we both share a very similar sentiment. Revolution is not a one-time event. It is becoming always vigilant for the smallest opportunity to make genuine change in established, outgrown responses. We share a common interest, survival, and it cannot be pursued in isolation from others simply because our differences make us uncomfortable. Not to believe that revolution is a one-time event or something that happens around us rather than inside of us. Not to believe that freedom can belong to any one group of us without the others also being free. And if we wait to put our future into the hands of some new messiah, what will happen when those leaders are otherwise disempowered? Do we put our future on hold? To refuse to participate in the shaping of our future is to give it up. Do not be misled into passivity, either by false security, in brackets, they don't mean me, or by despair, in brackets, there's nothing we can do. Each of us must find our work and do it. It means actively working for change, sometimes in the absence of any surety that change is coming. It means doing the unromantic and tedious work necessary to forge meaningful coalitions. It means knowing like coalition like unity means the coming together of whole self-actualized human beings, focus and believing, not fragmented automatons marching to a prescribed step. It means fighting despair. Audre Law demonstrates to us beautifully the futility of what is called reactive allyship, often synonymous with tokenism, performative allyship, white saviorism, and fragility. Painting an illusion that you are doing the fundamental work when in essence the only person you are actually serving is yourself. It serves your ego's role of wanting to protect you to be validated for everything you do with external changes and results. When in reality, you may never see the results of your allyship shift. This psychological comfort retreats you back into your privilege when discomfort is a repetitive theme within anti-racism work. For this journey to be sustainable, is to let go of what once was and welcome in the unknown and not knowing the full picture before participating. To throw yourself into action because it is the right thing to do, not just because those around you are doing it. 
to unknowingly invite ourselves, to reprogram our minds, to see images like these as anti-racism practices and a further strive for justice. To realize that revolution actually isn't pinned down to one or a handful of activists, because you are a much needed participant in this journey. A key part of these demonstrations coming into fruition requires people to evaluate their lives, their resources, their skills, their capitals, and showing up. Changing our landscape on what societal transformation looks like doesn't mean to fully negate the role of protests and demonstrations, nor other more radical and overt means. It just means to open our hearts to be more accepting and inclusive of other more holistic actions. Which means we need to listen and take on board other people's vision of revolution. What this means to them. Find a common ground and find empowerment for our differences. To not let what Audrey describes as despair or false security lead us into a collective dream deferred. However, how does real systemic change occur? It's a big question. We can start with proactive allyship, which is a long journey, but with practices ingrained in your daily life, it can become your greatest teacher in relation to social justice causes and yourself. Rather than short bursts of guilt-driven performances, which we observed in 2020 and beyond, Shifting our allyship tells us to be gentle, to listen to your body before it burns out, to be intersectional, to become a fundamental part of your culture and find confidence in what you can offer, which will then give you the tools in order to influence your sphere, never mind the rest of the globe. Rather than be deterred away of the scale of issues that we have at hand, we can allow hope and determination to see justice fulfilled be a guiding light, forever shining bigger and brighter. Now, I may never be able to speak for an entire community of people, but I do believe we all, conscious or subconsciously, would like to pave the way one by one and step by step to seeing justice fulfilled and fulfilling a better world for everybody. Despite Audrey and I advocating completely two different eras, there's no doubt that our cries are starting to sound the same. And I think we both believe that revolution starts with all of you sitting here or watching this right now. And now you're all almost probably thinking, but how? Where do we start? Where do I start? Trust me, I'm still asking the same questions and trying to find that concrete answer. But I don't think there is one. However, I don't see this as daunting, rather abundant and quite exciting. Because with that unknowingness and ambiguity, it means everybody has a part to play and can get stuck in in the course. The answers are within us individually, communally, structurally, societally, and so forth. I know this because in the Bright and Black Lives Matter protest, do you know what was one of the best things someone could do if they were unsure? Or sure? Is say, I don't know, but I want to try. And I am trying. And that determination, humility, is what forges meaningful and sustainable coalitions. That humanness, what Audrey describes as whole self-actualized human beings that are focused and believing, is what deconstructs messiahdom, ego, despair, and false security. 
Societal change is therefore being the best person you can be, while simultaneously trying to deconstruct the system we are already existing in. For as Audre Lorde states, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. We are not perfect, but we are stronger and wiser than the sum of our errors. So, I'm going to leave you a couple of questions. What can you do to make racial justice a part of our future? Not just yours. How can you be a part of decolonizing revolution? And most importantly, how can you be a better person starting from today? Thank you for listening. <laughs>